Okay, let's begin lecture. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, physics today, um, isotopes and atoms, nuclei. Uh, but before we do that, I believe there's a couple questions. Uh, go ahead. The question was, in web courses, there's two astronomy sections that you're enrolled in. One is the regular Astronomy 2002 Section 3. The other is called GEP Astronomy, and that's for all sections. And that is nothing for you to worry about now. There's um, some kind of diagnostic testing that the university, I'm actually the one that sets it up for the university, for all the astronomy sections. And it's this little diagnostic test that we, we try to get, you know, as many uh, students to take as we can. We've had several hundred already take it. And that's good. That's, the, that's sufficient for our, perp, our planning purposes. It's not part of your semester grade. Uh, so if you didn't get to it, don't sweat it. If you did it, hopefully you did it, you did your best. And uh, that's good. All right, so you don't have to worry about taking it. It'll still show up on your web courses, but you can ignore it for now. There's, there's nothing else to do in there. Question? How long have you been in the web homework? How long will I be extending the homework for the people that don't have eye clickers? Uh, I extended the very first one about, uh, I think it's called Introduction to Mastering Astronomy. I extended that another month until the end of February. Um, and if you're, if you're still, raise your hand if you're still trying to actually get into masteringastronomy.com. If you are, are still out, you've got to read discussions. There's a method in discussions. You email Evelyn Nemi and she'll get you squared away. She's already done like 15 students. Okay, so do that. And I'm going to expect all you guys to get it done. Now, so raise your hand if you haven't actually purchased the access yet. A few of you. Okay, those of you, is that your case too? Huh? Oh, it's in the, the check's in the mail. The access code is in the mail. Uh, yeah, you're SOL temporarily. Um, you're just going to have to get it as soon as you can. All right. And I'm not going to extend any more homeworks. I mean, if you're, if you're still fussing around with, you know, uh, mastering astronomy, not letting you in and stuff like that, and you have the access code, it means you messed up and you're not looking at discussions. Look at discussions. There's a perfect method in there for you to get it squared away. So get it squared away ASAP. All right. And the extensions, I'll have to, if you tell me that you haven't purchased it, I'll, uh, or it's still in the mail. Where did you buy it from? The bookstore. The, their website? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll have to, we'll have to uh, handle that. Any other questions about lovely, lovely masteringastronomy.com? Yes. Yeah, and I, I just reset it, I think, last night to um, February, I think it's February 26th or February 21st, one more month. And so I think it'll change that zero into a, and, I, you know, we're going to have so many points in there that 39 is going to look pretty pale. But, uh, and that one's not really astronomy, it's just how do you use the equipment, so. Okay. Um, last time we talked about uh, Kepler's, let's see if I can get this to, here we go. Uh, we talked about Kepler's three laws of motion and planetary motion. And this being the one that's of most importance to us, the third law, this is the form 
that Sir Isaac Newton figured out uh, P is the period, A is the semi-major axis, and then there's a bunch of constants up here. This is the one that allows us to figure out the, the both of the masses of a pair of planets if they're close enough, if we can triangulate the distance, and if we can actually measure the, the width of at least one of the semi-axes, uh, and if we can see both stars, we can get it. Okay, it takes a little bit of math. We're not going to focus too much on the math, but the formula is there. And this is a very famous example here. This is Sirius, and Sirius is actually a double star. It's the brightest star in the sky, Sirius A. And uh, it's, and matter of fact, I was looking at it last night. Uh, if you get up after, if you get out, I should say, after dinner, uh, 8 o'clock, just look toward the, look up and look east. Uh, and you'll see Orion, you'll see uh, Gemini, you'll see Taurus. Taurus is way high up. Pleiades way high up in the sky. Uh, Orion is rising from the east. And... Uh, Sirius is also uh, kind of low in the east, in the, in the early evening, and then it'll, it'll rise and swing across the sky later in the evening. Uh, but it was one of the first stars that they were actually able to see. Ooh, there's something orbiting that. They could see a wobble. They could see that something, they knew that there was another star there, they just, they, it, but it took them a while to actually measure it. And if you look at this particular um, set of measurements. This one starts in 1950 uh, up here and it goes all the way to 1999. All right, and so that's about a 50 year orbital period. Sirius A is this one, Sirius B is the one that's orbiting, and it's a white dwarf star. It's very hot, it's white hot, it's hotter than the sun. But it's pretty small, so it's hard to it's hard to see. It's hard to separate in the glare from Sirius. Sirius itself is really, really bright, and it's pretty close, and so it's hard to see that little thing. But we eventually got it, uh, and we've been tracking it. And from that, uh, from using this particular law here with M1 and M2, um, you know, we can measure uh, the masses. Uh, of the of both planets, or both did I say planets? Yes, uh, both stars. Yes, galaxies. Yes, if we can, if we can measure, especially measuring the uh, semi-major axis. So write down measuring a. That means measuring the semi-major axis. If we can bag that, then we can get everything. And, but it's hard to do that if it's really really far away. You know, because it's hard to get parallax. Remember, parallax. Oh, by the way, I was looking at a, a website that I really, really hate, and that's Wikipedia, and I hardly ever use it for, for Jack. But I was looking for, excuse me, I hardly ever use it for anything. And, but I was looking for some images of parallax, and they, they actually have a really nice image of parallax, you know, and how to triangulate a star and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. It's a nice one. Uh, anyways... This is the toughest one, triangulating uh, to measure A and LS, that means light seconds. Uh, so, you know, getting, you know, the number of light seconds, like the, the Earth to Sun distance, one astronomical unit is about 500 light seconds. It's about eight minutes and change. And the other planets, you know, Jupiter's many, many more, and Venus is fewer than 500 and so forth. And, you know, it's a convenient... Uh, unit light seconds for measuring uh, planetary systems, but uh, stellar systems, uh, it's not quite so uh, useful. Here's the stellar system that we were looking at Thursday, um, the black hole Sagittarius A star at the very center of our galaxy. You can look in the direction of this uh, in the summer. When you look at the constellation Sagittarius, go ahead and make a note. Constellation Sagittarius uh, is, it looks like a teapot. It's supposed to be a guy with a bow, a bow and arrow, Sagittarius, the archer. Uh, but to me, it looks like a teapot. 
and it's pouring water into the center of the galaxy. Or it's pouring tea into the center of the galaxy. Anyways, it's, but it's not up now. Uh, about four or five months from now, you should be able to see it, start seeing it. Um, and the black hole that, that we have been observing for a while uh, is right down here where the circle and the plus sign are, Sagittarius A star. This is the star S2. The, this is the one that we've been tracking uh, from 1992. And when this was published back in 2005, I believe, they had, this was their last item of data. And I'm, I'm sure that they've since uh, measured some more data points, some locational points. Here are the specs for this particular uh, star, S2. It's period of 15.2 years. Now that's equivalent to a planet orbiting one of our outer planets. They take multiple years. You know, Earth takes one year. Uh, and Mars is, I believe, about two years. And Saturn is more Jupiter, uh, Uranus, Neptune. Uh, so this is more like a planet, but it's, it's actually a star. Um, the eccentricity of its orbit, we talked about that last time, 0 0.87. It's really elongated. And this one, the elongation is, is marked vertically. Uh, Semi-major axis, they measured it in uh, so many, 119 uh, thousandths of an arc second. 119 milli arc seconds. Now, the way that you would abbreviate that in your notes, 119 MAS, milli arc seconds. Uh, which, don't worry about memorizing that. This is a better way to express the semi-major axis. 5.5 light days. Okay, so for this thing, it's got a pretty big um, uh, semi-major axis, 5.5 light days. That's bigger than the solar system. But it's, you know, it's got an eccentric orbit. And it's got a bit pretty big object in the middle, 3.7 uh, times the mass of the, 3.7 million times the mass of the sun. S2 itself is about 15 times. Go ahead and make a note of that. S2, 15 solar masses. So that's the star that we can see. And we deduce that something of enormous mass is right here based on the shape and size of this orbit. Now, it's a black hole, we're pretty sure. And a black hole has an event horizon. The event horizon, uh, as I believe I mentioned before, that is the point of no return. And once you get inside the event horizon, it's dependent on the, the mass, how, how many kilograms of mass in the black hole. Once you get inside the event horizon, there's no escape. Not even light can escape. The escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. And uh, so the event horizon here is 37 light seconds. So the semi-major axis, this is where, you know, this is the average distance, okay, uh, of the orbit, 5.5 light days. And the danger zone is at 37 light seconds, okay? So that's way, in, that, you know, that's way smaller than Earth's orbit. Earth's orbit is 500, and this is way smaller than that, about, you know, I don't know, 12, 13 times smaller than Earth's orbit. So a question may arise in your, in your mind, you know, is it safe? Is this star S2 going to get sucked into the black hole? Well, one of the ways that you can decide that um, is by taking the ratio of the semi-major axis, its average location, and the event horizon. And it works out that the ratio is about 13,000. In other words... The semi-major axis is about 13,000 times bigger than the event horizon, or further out from the, than the event horizon. Therefore, it's safe for now. Another way to look at it, the closest approach, and when you're talking about some star other than the sun, go ahead and write down this vocabulary term, periastron, P-E-R-I-A-S-T-R-O-N. 
periastron, that's the perigee point, the perihelion point for some star that you're talking about. Okay? And so the star that we're talking about is uh, Sagittarius A star. It's actually a black hole. Uh, but the closest point of approach uh, is about 1,700 times the event horizon. And I worked all this out on my, uh, my computer. Uh, actually, last night, I believe I was messing around with this. And so, uh, so S2, that star that we've got tracked, it's pretty safe. Now, there's other stuff. People have been observing you know, big blobs of hydrogen gas that are heading into the black hole. We could see those two in infrared. This one is just a map of one star that we've been studying that is the one that they really got a good measurement for the Kepler's third law mass of this black hole. But we're looking at other stuff, and there's other stuff that's causing mayhem down by the event horizon. So, but uh, S2 is pretty safe for now. Unless some other star comes by and changes its orbit, which can happen, and if it changes its orbit, it might, you know, go, it might dive straight down into the black hole, and then it won't be very long. Uh, one last thing about this event horizon, I think 37 seconds. What that means is that the point at which you cross the point of no return, Matthew, the event horizon, you're going to have about 37 seconds before you get down, maybe a little bit more, uh, before you get smushed out down at the very center. Because the event horizon is 37 light seconds away from the very center where everything's smushed down to zero volume. Um, a galactic black hole, you probably could survive crossing the event horizon because it's relatively large. In other words, the tidal forces that would rip you apart and turn you into a big piece of, you know, linguine uh, or spaghetti, uh, those are for smaller black holes where everything's a lot tighter. So if there's a supernova that leaves behind a black hole remnant, which we think happens quite a bit, those are called um, astrophysical black holes. Uh, in other words, the remnant of a big star bigger than the sun. Uh, those black holes, they'll grease you right at, before you get to the event horizon. Because they're so small, the gravity's going to uh, just pull you apart or anything uh, as you get closer to the event horizon. This one, maybe not. That's a pretty big event horizon. So Kepler's third law, yeah, we really, we're going to be using it a lot. It's one of our chief tools. Another tool that I want to give you some more instruction on today is the uh, is electromagnetic spectra. And we've already viewed the Balmer series, um, H alpha. The other three lines of the Balmer series, H beta, H gamma, and H delta, this is an actual photograph taken, and there's H epsilon all the way out here. They're tough to get all the colors uh, unless you have a really good dark lab and really good film and everything like that. But there was a guy from Switzerland named Joseph Balmer back in the 1800s, and he was trying to figure out, um, you, know, you know, what's the numeric relationship between the wavelengths? Because they, they knew what the wavelengths of these colors were. You know, 656 nanometers for H alpha. And they knew H beta wavelength really precisely. And he, he was, you know, he was trying to figure out, okay, you can count them from 1 to 4, 1 to 5 on this diagram, all the way out to H epsilon. Uh, but they, you know, it's the wavelengths don't multiply. You know, it's not uh, wavelength uh, H alpha wavelength times two for H beta, or times three for H gamma. And so he was trying all different kinds of numerical patterns. I have no idea how he figured this out, but he did. He figured out that if you take uh, n uh, greater than two, so starting at three, 
and you square it and subtract the inverse of that from 1 over 2 squared or 1 fourth, um, it's proportional to the inverse wavelength. Uh, and go ahead and write that formula down and then write down next to it uh, a little uh, icon or emoticon of some guy that's, you know, like crazy because that's crazy complicated. All right. Now, you're not going to have to calculate. My physical science students, we calculate with Balmers. It's not that hard, but it's really complicated how that guy, you know, it's just like Kepler figuring out ellipses. How he ever did that, I have no idea. How Balmer figured this out, uh, I have no idea. But what he found was that it's, it's counting numbers. It's just numbers. Sure, you got to square them, and then you got to go one over that. And then you got to subtract that from one fourth. And then you got this constant R. This is known as the Rydberg. I'll spell that for you the Rydberg constant for hydrogen. Uh, what is it? 110,973,732 per meter. Go ahead and write it down, and then put another uh, another emoticon to indicate that this one is smelly. We're never gonna, you're never gonna calculate them with this stinky old number. But there's a lot of nerd, nerdly guys, you know, that do. They use the, the Rydberg constant, Rydberg, R Y D B E R G, some Scandahuvian guy. I don't know from Norway or something, Sweden, I guess. Uh, figure this out. The Rydberg constant, and uh, it's just, it, but it's it's a it's a relatively complicated looking, but not that hard to work with. Uh, and so, it leads you to this question: you know, you've got an, a regular law, very very easy to express. It's not like some mile long calculus equation. It's it's pretty easy. You know, a little bit of fractions, but heck, you know, seventh grade, you tackle fractions. You don't have to have calculus to, to tackle fractions. So, so Balmer's thinking to himself, hey, this isn't too bad. And it's regular. I mean, it's countable. You know, nothing like that is it. There's nothing like that. This was the first hint of the quantum world. And the theory that explains Balmer's discovery... Balmer's uh, formula uh, is called the quantum theory uh, of hydrogen. So let's take a look at the quantum theory of hydrogen. Go ahead and draw yourself a hydrogen atom here. And my protons are always red. My electrons are always blue. And hydrogen is pretty simple. Now, we don't think that they orbit on circles now. But for our purposes today, circular orbits are kosher. You know, they're they're a little bit more a little bit fancier than that. And here's the beginning of the quantum theory of hydrogen. Uh, only a few orbital levels are allowed, and so unlike uh, like the space shuttle or the space station, we can park that at any altitude we want, pretty much. You know, once we get it up there, we can fire retro rockets to put it up higher or bring it down lower. We could put geosynchronous uh, satellites way out there. You know, the ones that you aim your, uh, your dish antenna to to get satellite television? Uh, those are up there at a very precise altitude. We can, can calculate that as nice as we want. And we could put a satellite anywhere we want in between, you know, about the, about the level of the space shuttle. That's considered low Earth orbit. And geosynchronous, that's a high Earth orbit. Uh, anywhere in there we could put one. But atoms, no. Atoms don't do that. And side note, atoms are not gravitational. They are electromagnetic. It's a uh, positive proton attracting negative electron. So the force that keeps the space shuttle and the, sp and the space station and all the communication satellites and all our, you know, the Hubble, all that, that's a gravitational interaction. And we got a pretty good handle on that. You know, Houston puts 
spacecraft up all the time. And Jeff Bezos and all these cats. Who's that other guy? Elon Musk. SpaceX. They're all trying to get their technology perfected to where they can just do it on a commercial basis. Yeah, we can, we can handle that. But electrons, for some reason, they behave as if only certain orbits are allowed. In other words, you know, space station's about 200 miles up. And that's not very high. Uh, and this is like saying, okay, the space station can only orbit at 200. It can't go to 201. Okay? That's what this is like. That's the way atoms and electrons in atoms operate. Space, space station doesn't do that. We can put it at 201 if we want. But atoms, no. Electrons, no. Because they're so small. And I'm going to give you the, exp the uh, theoretical explanation for that in a few minutes. All right, so they can only live at certain orbital levels. Therefore, um, only certain uh, orbital energies. You know, once you figure out the electric charge in the nucleus, plus one here for the proton, and the electric charge on the electron, minus one, and the distance, you know its energy state. And once that's set, um, you know, you know, you've got a series of different energy levels here for every orbital. Go ahead and make a note of that. For every orbital altitude, there's an orbital energy state. It is fixed. There are no other orbital energy states allowed for an atom. Spacecraft, we got them out the wazoo. Gravity's a little bit, it behaves a little bit differently. Uh, and so, so here's what you do. You, you number the orbits. From n equals 1, that's all the way down. That's, the, that's what we call the ground state. That's the, the lowest possible orbit. No orbits are allowed below that. Other orbits are alo allowed above that, bigger than that, but that's the minimum size orbit. It's called the ground state. n equals 2 is the first excited state. N equals 3 is the second excited state. Uh, or you could just say N equals 2. The N equals 2 energy level. The N equals 3 energy level. The ground state, N equals 1. All right? And so what we think happens is that an electron that um, drops down to a different uh, energy level for instance, for hydrogen, when it goes from n equals 3 down to n equals 2, that's when it emits a red H alpha photon. That change in orbital energy is exactly the energy of the red H alpha photon. Now, if you go from n equals 4, that would be this one out here. Uh, that's the last one that I have mapped out on my diagram. From n equals 4 down to n equals 2, that would be H beta. That's the kind of aqua, greenish aqua uh, spectral line. Those photons from n equals 4 dropping even more energy and landing at n equals 2, uh, those photons are bluish green, and we saw those in class. Uh, by the way, these energy jumps from one orbit to the next and nothing in between, that's what you call a quantum leap, a quantum transition. And there's a famous TV show uh, back in the 80s, I, I take it, called Quantum Leap. Uh, but it, it wasn't about electrons. It was about some guy, time travel. I, I didn't even have a TV back in the 80s. And most of you guys weren't even born back in the 80s, so... Anyways, you see it on TV every once in a while, I guess, these days. So this is, this is the idea that something small like an atom, only certain energy levels are permitted. And when the, atom wa when the electron wants to drop to a lower energy level, it may, but only to the next allowed energy level or one below that. Okay, only certain transitions, only certain quantum leaps. And those quantum leaps, 
the permitted quantum leaps correspond to different colors. Let me repeat that. Specific sets of quantum leaps correspond to specific colors in the spectrum that we observed. And Balmer knew about the different colors. He measured the wavelengths, I'm sure, or had a friend measure the wavelengths. But nobody, until these guys, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr, uh, nobody was able to figure it out and why it works. Uh, Niels Bohr is the guy in the foreground. Einstein's back. And this is at some conference in like 1926 or something like that. And they look pretty comfortable. They're probably talking about females. Uh, but maybe they're talking about electrons. Anyways, the Niels Bohr is a famous Danish scientist. He developed it. And then Einstein kind of uh, was his, not really his assistant, but Einstein uh, added some um, other necessary parts to the structure. And let's take a look at it in detail here. The quantum theory of hydrogen. The number of orbits as the, as the electron drops to a lower orbit, lower electrical potential energy, EPE. Uh, and you'll see the word potential energy mentioned in, I believe, chapter 4. Uh, it emits a photon with the missing energy. So, you know, this goes from a state of higher energy here to a state of lower energy at n equals 2. It's dropping down to a lower level. Where does that energy go to? It goes into the photon. And depending on the photon, depending on the electron transition, depending on the quantum leap, you have a photon of a, that, that gives you um, a different color. For n equals 3 down to n equals 2, it's the beautiful H-alpha transition. And N equals 4 down to N equals 2. Uh, it's the H-beta, the kind of bluish green one. Question? Drew? Uh, what's the stimulus that caused this to initially cause the jump to the quantum leap? The question was, what's the stimulus that causes the quantum leap? The stimulus is that nature likes to go downhill to the lowest energy level. Not entropy, but um, I guess you could call it, maybe you could relate it to entropy. But in general, it's the same thing as, you know, if you take a skateboard at the top of the aisle, or in the middle of the aisle, take a skateboard to the middle of the aisle, nobody goes uphill, everybody goes downhill. And it's because of the structure of, the energy structure of, of this. You know, and, but we can do it on any level of the, of the aisle that we want. We could start you at any level and you go straight down. Atoms, no. Matter of fact, here's another side note. You can't, uh, once it's in the ground state, it can't go any lower than that. It can only get bumped up. Now, here's the opposite side of your question, Drew. What stimulates something to jump up? Well, a photon of the right color banging into it. The reverse process is also true. If I have an electron here at n equals 2, and it's uh, H alpha photon, it'll bang that electron up to the n equals 3 level. And in general, if, if, if you have a, a hot gas, uh, Drew, most of your electrons will be at higher energies. If the, gas coo the hydrogen gas cools, or any gas really, it'll tend to have uh, a distribution of electrons at lower and lower states as it cools. And then when it's totally cooled down, everything will be in the ground state. Okay. Question behind Drew. Yeah, that's what that's what causes you know stuff to get up there. So they, they have to get up there so they can cut back down and drop a little energy that goes out in the photon. Right? So so heat will do that. You know, and, and other photons will do it. Stuff like that. And and you've read about that in in the textbook. So here's the, here's the picture again. And let's just take a look at it. Uh, H beta n equals 4 down to n equals 2. And of course H alpha is n equals 3 down to n equals 2. H gamma n equals 5 down to n equals 2. 
And H delta, that's this one over here, n equals 6 down to n equals 2. And I believe the wavelength of uh, H delta is like 434 nanometers. So it's right at the edge of the V in Roy G. Biv. So a little bit shorter wavelength, and it's going to be an ultraviolet, and we won't be able to see it. Uh, but there's actually another line over here, H epsilon, uh, that's almost into ultraviolet. Okay. So this is the... These energy levels, and only these energy levels, are the guts of the Balmer formula. And you can make a side note to this. It is also the reason that hydrogen has a fingerprint. Why is that? Because the, compared to helium, helium has a different nucleus. It's got two protons in the middle of it, two neutrons. Now, the neutrons don't affect the electromagnetic interaction uh, with the electrons orbiting the helium nucleus, but the protons sure do. You have twice as much uh, electromagnetic interaction, and that affects the energy levels that are permitted, and it affects uh, the colors that are emitted by helium. And you saw a different set of colors for helium. They have their own specific uh, fingerprints, and that is why, as I have mentioned before, Every element has its own fingerprint because of these electron energy levels. Now, they might be infrared. They might even be microwave. They might be ultraviolet, but we measure them all of the time. Molecules as well. The molecules are way more complicated than this simple hydrogen uh, model. We see the same thing. Now, the problem with this is, you know, why does nature, it's like, it, it's like, okay, only certain energy levels are allowed. It's like your mom telling you, why do I have to go to bed? Because I said so. You know, do you ever have your, your mom say that? Because I, you know, I see a bunch of people nodding their head. Yeah. I think everybody's, but nature's not like that. There's always a physical reason. And, and Drew, it's going to involve entropy, maybe, or energy, or something like that. But, you know, Einstein and Niels Bohr and those cats, they didn't figure out why those rules are set, those quantum rules, certain energy levels and no others, because mom says so. Now, that, that's basically where they're at. But the guy that figured out what mom was thinking, what Mother Nature was thinking, is this guy. Louis de Broglie. And what Louis de Broglie figured out uh, was why nature selects these orbits. And his theory is called the wave theory of the electron. We know that light is a wave. It behaves as a wave, and that is why you were able to observe the spectrum of hydrogen. Waves diffract when they go through a diffraction grating. Waves diffract when they go through any kind of a barrier. Uh, particles do not do that. Particles just go straight through. But particles reflect. There's all kinds of particles. There's all kinds of uh, properties of light that are explained by being a particle. And Sir Isaac Newton thought that light was a particle. And other guys thought, no, light's actually a wave because we can see these diffraction patterns and interference patterns. And there's a big controversy. And now we call, you know, many people call that the, the wave-particle duality for light. It's not really a duality. It's a oneness. It, the light is just something that has both behaviors by nature. There's nothing split about it. And what de Broglie said was, Think of the electron the same way. Think of the electron as a wave going along its orbit, buzzing along, but it's not a particle going from point A to point B. It's a wave. And you know, like a wave in the ocean, you know, you don't say a wave in the ocean is at point B, and then later it's at point A. I mean, the wave is, you know, if it's a wave, it's spread out, you know, for 
miles, hundreds of miles. You know, we get big surf over here in uh, Cocoa Beach and stuff when there's a storm off the coast of Af West Africa. You know, those waves come all the way across the Atlantic sometimes, hundreds of miles, thousands of miles. And, you know, so you don't really localize a wave the way you do a particle. And what de Broglie said was, uh, think of those uh, electrons as if they're waves. Here's a picture. There's any number of pictures. This is what he was thinking. He was thinking that if you have a wave that does exactly one full oscillation up and one full oscillation down in the, you know, in other words, one wavelength equal to the circumference of the orbit, then it will set up a resonance or what we call a standing wave. It will be permanently in that state. And if it's not that particular wavelength, it'll annihilate itself. It'll, it, w it won't set up a standing wave. Did we do the sound demonstration with the, with the tuning forks? Okay, tuning forks are the same. That is a resonance, uh, very specific wavelength, very specific structure to that box, very specific structure to the tuning fork, very specific structure to the atom. Therefore, very specific wavelengths. This is not like a pitch because it's, it's an electron. Electrons don't make music. It would be nice if they did. But this one right here in the middle, that's, the, that's like the lowest note. No, actually, that's the highest note. This is the second highest note. Right? This one is two full squiggles all the way around. So it's like going like this. Up, down, another peak, another valley, and then fold that all the way around the circumference. The next one out is this one. Here's, one, here's a peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, and then trough over here, kind of in perspective. Three full squiggles. And that's what de Broglie hypothesized. He said, if electrons are the same as photons, in other words, if electrons are particles and waves at the same time, then I figured out what Mother Nature's thinking. You know, and he said, Mother Nature's being very reasonable about it. It's not like, you know, because I said so, it's because if you do this, if you have an electron with this wavelength, it'll, it'll stay in its orbit. It won't degrade. It won't uh, destroy itself. Go ahead and write down the word destructive interference. Destructive interference. Destructive interference is like in the ocean when a wave, the peak of one waves, uh, you're in. Alany, right? Okay. All right. Uh, destructive interference is like when a peak of one wave meets the trough of another wave at exactly one point. So you got a tall wave and, you know, the upper part of the wave, and then you got the deep part of the wave of another wave meeting at the same place, you get flat water. So destructive interference for ocean waves is a peak meeting a trough yielding flat water. Electromagnetically, flat water is no light. Flat water is no light. And that is why when you look at H alpha, you see it in a specific direction and no other until you get to the next whole set off to the right or off to the left. And everywhere in between those, you know, the first red H alpha line and the second one, for red, it's all flat water. Now, you got greens, you got maybe yellows in there and oranges and stuff, but you don't have another H alpha anywhere in between there. It's all destructive interference. And so the same thing with this. If you don't have the right wavelength, 
you'll get flat water. You, you won't have an atom. You won't have an electron. This is the way that electrons uh, exist. An electron exists, and this is the only way that it can exist. If its wavelength exactly matches one circumference, or half a circumference, or a third of a circumference, and so on and so on, and those are the energy levels. All right, get your clickers out, because I want to ask you some uh, basic questions now about atoms and nuclei. By the way, you can read a lot about this stuff for hydrogen at approximately, approximately page 115 in chapter 5. Okay? Page 115 and thereabouts, you know, like 114, 116 in chapter 5. And let me get my clicker. And for those of you that have a new clicker, turn it on. Hold the power button down until you get a flashing square. And then type in A and then A again. And you'll get a message that says go nitro and then it'll, it'll say ready. And when you have that, is your clicker working back there? Again? All right. Uh, let's do some questions. Here's a, and, and these next questions uh, are in the way of kind of figuring out where you stand. In other words, kind of like a diagnostic question. All right, where do you stand? How much do you know about atoms and electrons? Here's question one. What's the difference between... Go ahead and read carefully and vote. Okay, 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, we got 170 people voting. I sure hope you all have your clickers. Yeah, we're going to start needing them. Uh, let's see what you guys voted for. Uh, yeah, most of you got it. All of these are correct. A few of you voted for A, B, and E. Uh, and actually, E is completely, that's like minus five. Uh, but all the other three are actually correct. Actually, I should give points for A and B and C. Hmm. Maybe I'll do that. Uh, anyway, that's correct. Uh, protons do have positive electric charges, and electrons do not. Electrons have a negative charge, unlike protons. Protons are positive. So A and B are flip sides of each other. So if you voted for A and you didn't vote for B, you got caught napping. And the only way to vote for A and B at the same time is to vote for D. Now, C you might not have known. And go ahead and write this down. An electron is much lighter than a proton. Electromagnetically speaking, they have the same charge. One's positive, one's negative. All right? But in terms of kilograms, um, their uh, sizes are definitely not the same. Now, this picture of jadeite, this is a picture of raw jade, beautiful gemstone. Um, the interaction between the electrons and the nuclei in the atoms of jadeite, that's where you get the beautiful shade of green. Why is that? Because some of the quantum leaps are key to green photons. So when you, when you see green there, uh, you know, it's because of green, you know, green energy transitions. Somewhere in this complex 
a set of molecules for jadeite. It's a pretty complicated molecule. Uh, but it's beautiful. I love jade. All right, next question. Let's see how sharp you guys are. You did pretty good on that last one. How many protons in a molecule of H2O? And here's the upper right side of the periodic table for reference, which you have the periodic table somewhere in your textbook, I believe. And for, for what we're doing now, we're kind of leading into the concept of isotope. You're going to want to know about the periodic table and just refer to it and stuff. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, you guys, let's see what we got here. Ooh. Big variation here. Let's take a look. A uh, lot of smorgasbord here. Majority voted for C, but a bunch of you uh, distributed your answers into the, all the other ones. Uh, the correct answer is C. Now, if you didn't vote for C, jot, and even if you did vote for C, jot down the reason. Okay, the protons in H2O. There's two hydrogens, one proton each. So that's two. And then in oxygen, most oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons. So here's the atomic number up here, eight. That always tells you the number of protons in the nucleus. And then this one tells you the total number of everything in the nucleus. So protons plus neutrons down there. Uh, and for uh, oxygen, it's pretty close to an exact 16. That's called the atomic weight down there. And when you look at your uh, periodic table in the textbook, there's a little blurb about what each of these numbers are. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about isotopes. Isotopes. There are three isotopes of hydrogen that are relatively common in the universe. And a normal hydrogen is uh, one proton and no neutrons. And that means in notation, this is isotopic notation. The mass number is here. The atomic number is here. Okay. Now, these guys up here, these are the isotopes. Here's regular hydrogen. Most hydrogen in the universe is like this. One proton, zero neutrons, and one electron zipping around. Now, all hydrogen has one electron zipping around and one proton. But some hydrogen in the universe, known as deuterium, uh, has a neutron in the nucleus. It's not very common, but it's, it's, you know, it's not super hard to, to filter your water and get a little bit of deuterium out. Okay? And in, notate, in isotopic notation, it's got one uh, proton down here and two things in the nucleus. So that tells you it's an isotope of regular hydrogen. Here's regular hydrogen. Here's deuterium. And deuterium is for the, from the Greek word for two, two things in the nucleus. And here's another one, tritium. Okay, and tritium is a hydrogen, one proton. All hydrogen has one proton. But some hydrogen very rarely has two neutrons in the nucleus. And they're bound by the nuclear force that binds all nuclei. And this one's called uh, tritium. And its isotopic notation is an upstairs three to indicate three things in the nucleus, three nucleons, we call it and one proton. And here's a blow up of that. Okay, so the lower number is always the number of protons in the nucleus. And then the top number is always 
how many other th how many total things do you have in the nucleus? So for tritium, that's a three up there. The chemical symbol is always H, though, to indicate that it's it's hydrogen, but it's an isotope. Isotope means that it's a heavy nucleus. Now let's keep going to the next page. We're talking about what is a nucleus, or what is an isotope. It's an atom with some extra neutrons in the nucleus. Think of it that way. Or maybe fewer neutrons than normal. And a good example is hydrogen. And we just talked about it. Regular hydrogen is one proton with an electron orbiting, the simplest atom in the universe, and the most abundant for that reason. Easiest to put together. I mean, you don't really have to put together anything except an electron. And 90, now write this number down. It's actually kind of important. 99.9885% of all hydrogens are this variety. One proton, one electron. Now deuterium, that's the uh, nucleus with proton and a neutron. That is 0 0.115%. So that's pretty small, but in, it's not too hard to, to isolate deuterium in the lab. Now, what deuterium looks like is this guy down here, uh, this lower diagram, proton and a neutron in the nucleus, and then an electron kind of zipping around. All right? Now, the exception to that abundance, 0.0115%. Uh, is, for instance, near a nuclear reactor. And in a nuclear reactor, regular hydrogen can be converted into deuterium because in a nuclear reactor, there's neutrons flying around. And if one of them gets gobbled up by a hydrogen nucleus, it's now a deuterium nucleus. All right, so we look for those. Uh, deuterium, D, usually symbolized uh, with the letter D, capital D. Uh, if you've ever heard the word or the phrase heavy water, heavy water is water with uh, deuterium in one of the two hydrogens. So DHO would be heavy water, one deuterium, one hydrogen. And hey, you guys, deuterium and, and hydrogen, they behave chemically the same way. But one of them's doubly heavy. It's, cause it, and you guys, a neutron and a proton are very close to the same mass. They're, they're both pretty small, but they're both about the same. And they're both about 2,000 times bigger than an electron. So ma most of the mass of an, an atom is the nucleus. Very small fraction from electrons. But without an electron, you don't have any chemistry. Third isotope, tritium. Okay? Proton and two neutrons with an electron. Tritium is pretty unstable. We can manufacture it in a nuclear reactor area. You know, bombard some deuterium. And we can isolate it in nature. It's pretty rare, though. Really rare. And... Uh... Tritium is what is used in, well, all three of these are used in nuclear uh, weapons. And uranium and plutonium are also used in uh, nuclear weapons. Those are very heavy isotopes of uranium and plutonium. But these are very light isotopes. And they're important in astronomy because most stars burn hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium through the course of billions and billions of their lifetimes. Now, you may be asking yourself, Dr. B, how do they know those abundances? You know, to those, you know, to, to six digits, 99.9885%, how the heck do they, well, the way they do that is they separate the, they take a bunch of water and they separate the isotopes. And how do they do that? Well, there's a couple different technologies that they use. Number one 
is the centrifuge. And if you've been paying attention to all these, this controversy over there in Iran, they're trying to get a nuclear weapon over there. And I don't care what they say, they're doing everything they can to get a nuclear weapon. Uh, they're, all the things that they're doing uh, with centrifuges, in this case, uh, is to separate uh, uranium-235, which is what you need for a, a weapons-grade uh, reaction, from natural uh, uranium. Uranium-235, I should have written it down here. Sorry I didn't. Uh, uranium-235 is an isotope, uh, and it's one of the more rare isotopes of uranium. It can be refined using a centrifuge. Another method is called gaseous diffusion. And they actually vaporize uranium, and they vaporize plutonium, uh, and then they send it through a, a filter. And only the, the lightest ones, the lightest isotopes like 235 tend to go through. The heavier ones, like uranium-238, tend not to go through. And that is a technology that they de developed uh, in the Manhattan Project during World War II. Uh, and, and put in place at Oak Ridge up in Tennessee. Another uh, World War II technology that is still used today is called the calutron, the electromagnetic separation. And basically, th this picture over here is a calutron uh, picture, the electromagnetic method of separation. And basically, you have a, a hot source, and things go flying out of this little window here, and then there's a magnetic field that is, um, you know, like the bar magnets are above and below this picture. And so the magnetic field is either going in or it's going out. And that causes the atoms to move on a circle. But because they have different mass, they go to different locations. Okay? And so... Um, uh, that's generally the method that is used for isotopic separation. They have different masses. Therefore, they're, when they're subject to the same forces, the lighter one will get going faster and get there sooner. And the heavier one will not. And that's basically what a centrifuge does, gaseous diffusion, electromagnetic, the calutron, and all the other methods. Now, they have methods that you're not allowed to talk about and, and that I don't even know anything about. So those guys, this is the old-fashioned stuff. It's all declassified. But by God, uh, 60 years ago, no, 70 years ago, in 1945, if I had this slide up, man, I'd have the FBI on my case and everybody else in here. Uh, so... Here's a picture of uh, Oak Ridge under construction. This is the Y12 plant. This is where they had calutrons. Here's, uh, you know, so just type in Oak Ridge and then Y12. You see all these kind of pictures. Big, huge building. This is the basic idea. So here's uranium chloride. And they ionize it. And then they send it out. And the magnetic field is perpendicular to the screen. And so the 235s... The uranium-235 is lighter, so it cuts the corner a little tighter. But 238, this is the form uh, of, 230, of uranium that's not that harmful. 235 is really radioactive. It's unstable. And, but 238 is a little bit heavier, so it's, kinda, it's trying to cut the corner, but it can't match 235. All right? So it's kind of like Tom Brady trying to evade... Von Miller, you know, Von Miller's got him. And so Von Miller's cutting the corner on Tom Brady. And Tom Brady's out here crying, trying to get around there, and he can't get around, and he gets tackled and sacked, and he's out of here. All right? Can you tell I hate the Cheatriots? Anyway, here's a good web source, a website uh, for that, if you want to look it up. All kind of stuff about the Manhattan Project. And that's the Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy. All that stuff is declassified, uh, so you can look at it. All right, more about what is an isotope. All elements have isotopes, including hydrogen. 
and some isotopes are stable. Now here are the three stable isotopes of oxygen. And this is pretty important because oxygen is very abundant in earth, in the crust of the earth, and in the oceans of, of the earth, you know, in water. Uh, and the three flavors of oxygen, they all behave chemically the same, but in a calutron, they can be separated because oxygen 16, it cuts the corner a little bit better than the other two guys. All right. Uh, now, some decay radioactive, uh, radioactively to daughter nuclei, and, but, but the three that we're looking at, 16, 17, and 18, those guys are stable. Now, some of the unstable uh, isotopes decay pretty uh, rapidly in a time scale of minutes and days. So an example of that is radium. All right. And radium is one of the first radioactive elements that was isolated uh, and they used it for a long, I, I think they still use it medically, Radi little tiny pieces of radium, but it's really expensive and really dangerous. Uh, carbon. Uh, there's an isotope of carbon that is unstable and will decay uh, on the scale of a few thousand years, about 5,000 years and change. And that is useful for archaeology and stuff like that. Okay, we can look at trees that 10,000 years ago fell to earth and stopped absorbing the radioactive uh, unstable isotope of carbon. And we can figure out by looking at how much is left, we can figure out the age. A really slow unstable nuclei, or unstable isotope is uh, uranium. R uranium decays to lead on a time scale of billions of years. And scientists use this actually to analyze rocks, to try to figure out the age of rocks that they discover uh, here and there on the planet Earth. And so age and, and location can be deduced by checking, basically checking how much you've got, parts per million, uh, ratios. And now I'm going to introduce a, t uh, a term of technology that you probably have never seen before. S-M-O-W. S-M-O-W. And I didn't misspell it. S-M-O-W. It's superimposed over a picture of a beach with waves coming from the ocean. Water waves from the ocean. S-M-O-W stands for standard mean ocean water. And what they've done is take uh, a zillion samples of ocean water in the oceans of, you know, so far away from New York Harbor where there's all the pollution and stuff. So way out in the middle of the ocean and deep, they take uh, samples and they analyze it. And the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 is about 2,005 parts per million. Okay, that's about uh, 0.2005%. Right? Now, if you have something else uh, from another planet, you might not, not have the same. But for ocean water on Earth, standard mean ocean water, mean means average, uh, it's, it's that abundance. Oxygen 17, the ratio of oxygen 17 to oxygen 16, Stable, they don't decay, they're stable nuclei. Uh, and on Earth, in our oceans, 379.9 ppm. All right, so we're, we're looking good. Uh, and that's about 0.0379%. 0.0379.9%. Now, what we do is use this set of proportions, and there's, there's also proportions for uh, hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium in ocean water. Uh, but the thing we're, that we're going to use a lot is the oxygen ratios. And so what we look at is, um, what's the SMOW uh, for, say, an uh, earth rock? Or so, down here on this other line here, the steep line with all the dots, 
Uh, that's the data line for uh, certain kinds of meteorites that fall to the Earth. Okay, so what we do is we measure the oxygen 18 ratio, we measure the oxygen 17 ratio, and then we plot it up on the sink. And if we find something that's down here, we're thinking to ourselves, well, yeah, a lot of stuff is similar to Earth, but there's not, but some stuff we found is not. So these guys up here, these meteors up here, these meteorites up here, they're right on the Earth moon line. Moon, moon rocks, Earth rocks, very similar. Moon rocks we got from the Apollo mission. Apollo missions. And but these guys down here, these ones, uh, CAIs, uh, those are out of the pattern. And that tells us something about the history of that particular meteorite. Now, look at this one. This is a meteorite that they found in 2011, just four years ago. It's called NWA7034. It is from Mars. And how do we know that? We've had all kinds... I'm starting to get excited now. And you know it's the end, of the, the end of the period. Oh, We've had all those rovers, all those little the toaster ovens on wheels up there, and we've got bigger ones up there now, and they're checking isotopes and checking everything they can. And so we know what's, what the isotope ratio is. SMO, SMOM, standard mean, standard, standard mean, SMRM, standard mean rock of Mars. We got it. And so has this. That's a chip of another planet. So, so an asteroid, here's what happens. An asteroid crashes into Mars, and all those fragments go flying out into space, and some of them landed in Northwest Africa, and somebody picked one up in 2011. All right, let's dismiss. I'll see you on Thursday, and we'll finish up isotopes. You're dismissed.